Well, mark this day down. It is the first time in the history of this church that we are doing both an in-person and an online church experience. Now, guys, we know it has been crazy, and it might not get any easier in the near future, but we are committed to being your church and fulfilling the mission that God has given us, regardless of the circumstances. So for those of you all that are engaging from your home, and for those of you that are gathered right here in this room this morning, good morning and welcome to Sunnyside, where we are a people following Jesus to those not yet. My name is Corey, and I'm one of the pastors here. It's my privilege to be able to bring the message today. Now, we've been in a series called Cross Examined, where we've been examining the various things the cross actually accomplished. Now, we have been calling these things gospel expressions. Ultimately, the good news or the gospel is tied up into two primary statements. We've all sinned and we find ourselves separated from God, and Jesus stands in the gap through the cross. Those are kind of the two primary statements of the gospel. However, Scripture uses different illustrations and words to describe what is actually happening when we take Jesus up on the cross that he offers to us. Now, throughout this series, we've tracked down several of these earthly illustrations to help you better understand the heavenly realities that accompany them. Our hope is that you will more fully comprehend what the cross accomplished, and you'll find your own story more clearly in one of these gospel expressions. So allow me to take you back to our stage set, our visual for this entire series, to walk you through some of the things that we, we have already been through, we've already talked about. Uh, we started off by, by understanding who God is. There is a God and that He is loving, He is just, and He is good. He is so much more than those things, but those are kind of the essential qualities to be able to understand the good news that He presents. Now, although God is loving, just, and good, you and I, we, we are not. Um, we are not God. We are not always loving. We're not always just. We're not always good. We actually do things contrary to who God is and what he does. That we lie while God himself is truth. We steal and take from others while he himself is the giver. He's the provider of all things. We murder and hate while God himself is, in fact, life. And when we do things that are contrary to the very nature of God, this is called Sin and st sin stands between us, imperfect us, and a perfect, holy God. And so what we've learned is that because of sin, apart from the cross, we are dying. We, we are enemies. We are orphaned. We are indebted. We are captive. We are broken. This is our condition apart from the cross, apart from the work of Jesus. But when the kindness and the love of our Savior appeared. When Jesus went to the cross on our behalf, something incredible took place. Our bad news was transformed into good news. You see, because of the cross, we are now alive because Jesus saved us. We, we are now friends of God because Jesus reconciled us. We are now children of God because God adopted us. We are now forgiven because God has redeemed us. We are now free because God has ransomed us. We are now whole because as last week we learned, God has restored our brokenness. See, this is what the cross has in fact accomplished, what God has done. But each one of us must ultimately receive it. We must trust in it. We must surrender to it in order for, for it to be our good news. It is the good news, but we, in order for it to be our good news, we actually must step on the bridge that is the cross in order to realize this good news for ourselves. Now today, today we're, we're closing up our series. We have two more weeks of this series, and this is not exhaustive, by the way. There are many more words and illustrations that are used, but we've got two more words that we're going to be looking at over the next couple weeks. Today, we're going to be turning our attention to this word, justified. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen the TV series Justified, but basically it's about a guy who hails from the great state of Kentucky. That's right. That's where I'm from. So you know it must be good, all right? Now, he ends up becoming a U.S. Marshal, but has kind of a different stance on how you should enforce justice. He takes more of an Old West way of settling things. And the whole series is basically about how this guy, Raylan, is justified and taking the law into his own hands. Now, when we think of the word justified, oftentimes it's in this particular manner. We think of, of excuses. I, I'm justified in doing something. In other words, I was justified in doing this or that typically bad or wrong 
thing. We give justification or excuse for why we have done what we have done. In other words, I, I, I have, I've had a really stressful day, so I'm justified by going to the bottle and drinking some alcohol, drinking some wine, settling myself down a little bit. My kids are incredibly disrespectful, so I'm justified in my anger towards them and raising my voice towards them and my actions towards them. My wife isn't meeting my sexual needs, so I'm justified in, in looking at pornography. Or my husband isn't meeting my emotional needs, so I'm justified in my fantasies. You know, everyone fudges their taxes. Everyone goes past the speed limit. Everyone watches that particular show. Therefore, I am justified in doing the same. However, this is not how Scripture approaches this term. In Romans chapter 10, Paul gives us kind of a, a beginning understanding of what this looks like. He says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. You see, justified is a legal term. It means to be made right with or to be squared up with. It has to do with, with, with guilt and with innocence. It's a legal pronouncement in a court of law. It's not an excuse. <laughs> Speaking of a court of law, have you ever had to appear before a judge in a court of law? I have. <laughs> That's right. Your pastor has had run-ins with the law. I'm basically a renegade and I'm a hardened criminal. It all started started while I was on a hike down in Arizona on my spiritual retreat day. So maybe I'm not a hard criminal. Maybe I'm just ignorant of, of certain laws. Anyway, I, I'm on this mountain and I've climbed up on the spiritual retreat day, having this great time with God. And, and I look down to where my car was at and, and I see a ranger vehicle pull up right next to mine. Uh, and he's there for quite a while. I can tell that he's looking for me. And so I say, you know, I need to go down and figure out what's going on. So I hustle down the mountain to see what's up. And when I get down there, he's nowhere in sight. Truck's still there. Now, I could have easily hopped in my truck and headed out, but I was trying to be a person of integrity. So I went looking for the ranger and I saw him up on the ridge um, on the trail that I'd gone up originally. I'd gone down a different trail and I flagged him down. As I flag him down, I'm having this conversation and I find out that I'm actually trespassing on Indian reservation property. And he proceeds to give me a ticket. Thanks for that. You know, that's what my integrity is worth, right? So anyway, he explains to me, you know what? It's not a big deal. You can go down to, uh, to the Indian court and um, they'll, they'll take care of it. It won't be a problem. So take him up on this. I drive about an hour and a half down um, to this Indian court. I sit in the courtroom with my ticket in hand, waiting my turn. Finally, it's time for me to explain that I didn't realize that I was trespassing and, and therefore this, of course, was my justification. However... Before I got my turn to share my excuse, the judge asked me a question. Uh, and it's a question you, you're probably very well aware of. You probably know what the question is before I even say it. And this is the question. She said, how do you plead? Now, this, this might sound silly to you, but I hadn't even thought about this. <laughs> I just, for whatever reason in my mind, I thought I would just go down there and have a conversation with the judge uh, of, about my justification, right? I mean, I, I did, after all, trespass, even if it was unknowingly. And so uh, when the judge asked, how do you plead? I answered her. I said, guilty. Well, she then proceeded to instruct me on my fine, pay the bailiff $100. Next case, case over. And just like that, <laughs> I was transferring money from my bank account and driving home a very defeated hour and a half back to my place of residence. You know, I learned a, a very valuable lesson that day. And here it is. When you plead guilty, there is no justification. When you plead guilty, you are guilty. Pay the fine. Next client, next case. No justification available for you. You know, I was uh, watching a, a movie with my wife. It's an older movie, and I'm, I'm sure many of you guys have seen it. It's called A Time to Kill. Uh, now, if you're not familiar with this, it's about a trial of a black man who killed two guys who had raped and attempted to kill his 10-year-old daughter. Now, uh, at the end of the movie, spoiler alert, if you haven't watched this movie since 1996, all right? But at the end of this movie, uh, Carl Lee, who is the defendant, he's the black man on trial, he's not just let off, but at the very end of the movie, uh, a kid runs out of the courtroom yelling, he's innocent, he's innocent. This is incredible to me. Because everyone knows that Carl Lee shot these two men. 
Everyone knows that he killed these guys. Yet the determination that the jury comes to is that he is innocent of a crime. In other words, he's justified. You see, justification is not an excuse for doing something we shouldn't do. It's a declaration that we are something that we have, in fact, not merited. You know, 2 Corinthians 5, it's, it's actually one of my favorite chapters in, in all of the New Testament. Uh, but 2 Corinthians 5, Paul is speaking to this church and, and he communicates something that, that I think all of us are, are pretty aware of, but sometimes we forget that this actually will take place. And this is what it says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. In other words, there is going to be a courtroom that each and every one of us is going to be sitting in someday before the holy God that has made us and has created us. And so I want to take you to the courtroom in just a moment. But before we get there, let me remind you of a few things that we've learned along the way as we've gotten to this point, all right? So coming back here to our illustration, in reality, we are all guilty of sin. Remember, sin separates us from a perfect, holy God. Even the smallest sin creates this chasm between us and God. Now, coming to this realization is a huge step in understanding the gospel, the good news. Because once you come to grasp with the fact that you stand separated from God, you now have a determination to make. Do you want to be with God? And if so, what can you do to get to him? Now, as I communicated in the first week of this whole series, most people try a series of reasoning that targets their behavior or, or their knowledge of God. Uh, in other words, if, if I'm over here, I, I start to think, well, if I could just be a little bit better than I was before, or if I can balance out the scales, or if from here on out I can try to be perfect, or if I can know everything that there is to know about God. But the problem is that everything that we do in terms of our behavior, even our knowledge, it all falls short. Let me, let me try to illustrate why. I'm going to put something up here. This is what I call the, uh, the scale of morality, all right? The scale of morality. And each and every one of us actually falls on this scale somewhere here, okay? So at the very top, we've got, we've got perfection, all right? Perfection's on the top. And, and at the bottom here, we have complete and utter evil, now, um, none of us, none of us are completely perfect. None of us are completely evil, which means that we fall somewhere along the scale. Now, I'm not only going to share this with you guys today for your own understanding, but this is actually a great illustration that you can use yourself when you're having a conversation with somebody about the necessity of, of the cross. And that's what we'll get to in a little bit. But each and every one of us falls on this scale Somewhere. So if I was asking uh, you, if you are here with me right now, I, I might ask you, you know, who, who's the worst person that you can think of? Maybe you'd come up with a person like Hitler, all right? So I'd ask you, where would you place Hitler on this particular scale? And certainly you would, you would put him somewhere down near the bottom. Now, he's not complete evil. He's not the epitome of evil, but he did a lot of bad stuff, all right? He had to have done some good things, and therefore he's not complete evil. So he's down here somewhere. Now, I may ask you this as well. Uh, can you think of the very best person that you know of? Now, maybe for you, uh, it's your grandma. Maybe for you, it was, a, it, was a, it was a pastor that you knew growing up or, or a Billy Graham or a Mother Teresa or, or a Corey Bullock. I don't know if you know me that well. I wouldn't fall in that category, right? But, but let's think of Mother Teresa. She's not perfect, all right? But she's up here on the scale. She's, she's an, an incredible person, right? She's done some, some really, really good things. Now, if I was to ask you somebody maybe in popular culture, we're going to find that person falls in between these people. So if I said, uh, hey, what would you think about Miley Cyrus? Miley, if you're watching this, no offense to you. I don't know you. All right, we're just putting you on the scale somewhere. She'd probably fall somewhere in between Hitler, all right, and Mother Teresa. Not as good as Mother Teresa, not as bad as Hitler. Now, all of this is nominal right now because because this is based upon good deeds and bad deeds. We don't really know these people. We just know the sum of their works. Or we can see some of the outward stuff. But what I would ask you to do then is I'd ask you to put yourself on the scale. So where would you put yourself on the scale? I'll start down here at the bottom. You tell me when to stop. Better than Hitler, okay? Some of you not as good as Miley Cyrus. But you're definitely not as good as Mother Teresa, right? So most of us would probably put ourselves on the scale somewhere here. This is, 
this is you, all right? This is me, this is us. We're, we're not as good as some, but we're, as, we're better than others. And somehow that gives us some kind of sense of, of accomplishment, right? Um, or, or maybe it doesn't. Maybe for you, it, it causes you harm because you go, man, there's just, I, I know I could get a little bit better. And so you're constantly trying to, to track up this scale a little bit. Now, again, inconsequential with all of this, even with you on this scale, with the exception of this, that all of us must actually stand before a holy God and give an account of the things done in our body, whether good or bad. In other words, there's going to be a day in which this scale is going to be divided. There's going to be a a horizontal line drawn somewhere here on this scale. And those who are above that get to go to heaven. And those who are below that go to hell. This is just what scripture tells us, guys. Now, the question I would have for you is, is where do you think that that line is drawn? And I do the same thing. I would start you down here at the bottom. I'd say, you tell me where you think that that line is drawn. You tell me, you tell me where to stop, okay? And so maybe I'd start down here and, and that line would be just above you. Okay. Those of us who understand our degradation, those of us who understand our sin, understand that we probably are not deserving of God's love and grace. And so we might put ourselves a little bit below the line. We might put ourselves a little bit above the line. Okay, but what, what if, what does this mean? If you're below the line, what does that mean for you? If Jesus came back today and he said, it's time to collect those saints, then you would be below the line. You would miss the cutoff. You would be below it. Wouldn't you want to do everything you could just to get above the line? Let me ask you another question. If God is a loving father, don't you think that he clarifies for us where that line happens to be? Don't you think that he would tell us very clearly what that looks like? I'd be a horrible father if I didn't happen to tell my kids what was right and what was wrong, what was going to merit a consequence and what was going to, uh, to, to give them a privilege, right? And I'm not even a great father, but God is a loving, good father. Of course, he tells us where the line is. But you and I might not like where he says that is. You know where he says it is? This is what we've been talking about from the very beginning, guys. Because of who God is, the line to allow you to be in his presence is perfection. So allow that to sit in for a moment. Allow that to soak in for a minute. Because what that means is that each and every one of us, even Mother Teresa, the best of us and the worst of us, all fall below the line. See, we're better than some, we're worse than others. There will be a line drawn that divides us from heaven and hell. Where does God draw it? At perfection, because he himself is perfect and cannot be in the presence of that which is not perfect. Therefore, we all fall short of the standard of God. And we need perfection. Yet we ourselves, on our own, by our own merit, cannot achieve it. No matter how much we do, we can't balance the scale because we still fall short of perfection. We can't start now being perfect because we have imperfections in our past. We all fall short of the standard of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due for the things that we've done in the body, whether good or bad. So let me take you to the courtroom. You're standing before a perfect, holy God. And he sits you down and he says, let's take a look at your life. Because we have to give an account for the things that are done, all, all the good and the bad things. And I don't know how this is going to play out. I don't know if there's like a video <laughs> that comes in and is like shows us all the good and, and all the bad. And, and maybe, maybe your, your bad is a lot longer than your good. Maybe your good is a lot longer than your bad. But, but re- regardless, you're going to be faced with all of that in front of a perfect, holy God. And, and you're going to find yourself in a predicament because God is going to ask you the same question that I got asked in the Indian courtroom by the judge. And he's going to ask you this. How do you plead? You just watch the film. You're guilty. You're guilty of both the good and the bad. And God the Father explains to you that he cannot allow someone with sin on them, unpaid, to enter into heaven, to enter into his presence. And just as he is about to slam the gavel and give you your sentence and move on to the next case, something incredible happens. Jesus, the very Son 
of God. Walks into the courtroom. His father nods at him like he's been expecting him. And Jesus speaks up. He says, Father, I have a solution. See, I know that you love him and I know that you love her, but they cannot be with you as they are. So I propose a sin swap. Say what? (laughs) I, I, I propose a sin swap. I will take on their sin and consequently their punishment. And in exchange, I will give them my perfection, my righteousness. And in this way, when you look at them, you will no longer see them with their sin on them, but you'll see them through my blood and that will make them right in your sight. You see, in that same chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul speaks this of Jesus in this great exchange. He says, God made him who had no sin, that's Jesus, to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. This is what I like to call the the great sin swap. We give him our sin. He gives us his perfection. Guys, that just, that that blows my mind. We we not only get the, the punishment that we deserve, we also get God's perfection laid on us. So you're standing in the courtroom and you hear Jesus' proposal and the father looks back at you and he says, how do you plead now? (laughs) I plead Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus. I plead the cross. I plead the sin swap that he has to offer. And the father looks back at you and he says, then I declare you justified. You see, being justified is different than being saved. It's, It's different than being forgiven. John Piper puts it this way, to be justified in a courtroom is not the same thing as being forgiven. Being forgiven implies that I am guilty and my crime is not counted. Being justified implies that I have been tried and I have been found innocent. Said it another way, uh, those of you all that can remember back to school days, right? Well, maybe you took a test and you just bombed the test. You got an F on the test. If the teacher was to do a, a kindness and they were to cancel from the record that exam that got an F, that's a great thing, right? But it's not the same as declaring that work an A. It drastically does something to your GPA if you, if you simply remove an F versus giving that particular thing an A. And that's what Jesus is doing here. I, I, I liken... I liken this whole scenario to a distinction that I once heard between mercy and grace. Here's the distinction. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. Because of our sin, we deserve punishment. But the father places this punishment on his own son. That's mercy, not getting what you deserve. Grace, however, is getting what you don't deserve. See, we we not only don't get punishment, we also receive Christ's perfection. You see, the cross, the cross is the basis of both our pardon and our perfection. Apart from Christ, I was guilty. But because of the cross, I am innocent because Jesus justified me. Guys, I, I've spent years trying to fully grasp this concept. And this is, this is very much a part of my story. And you've probably heard my story in part, and this is not going to be the whole of it, but I, I was very privileged to grow up in a, in a Christian home with parents who loved Jesus, who brought me to church. I was exposed to, to God and the love of his son Jesus from an early age. I knew about the cross. I even surrendered my life to Jesus at the age of six. I was six years old, and it was my own decision. Still remember the day. I still remember sitting down with my pastor at Dairy Queen and having a conversation. And he actually explained this, this bridge illustration to me. And I don't think I I fully understood grace at the time. Actually, no, I didn't. But I knew this. I knew I wanted to be with God. And I knew that Jesus through the cross was the only way. And so I received that at an early age. But but if I'm being honest with you, uh, even though I received it, I was still working on my salvation. I was still trying to work out my salvation. But in a very unhealthy way, I was still trying to be good enough. I I was still trying to, to earn my way to heaven, to earn God's love, to earn his grace. I didn't understand it. 
and, and as even I, I kept trying to earn this, I, I kept trying to do good things, I, I could never measure up. I kept climbing this morality scale, right? I was, I was better than most by most people's uh, assumptions. But, but I knew my heart. I, I knew my thoughts. I, I, I knew the sin inside of me. I, I knew the things that were done in secret. And no matter what I did, I would, I would never be good enough. Now, I, I, re- I got really good at hiding my inadequacies. I got really good at cloaking my motives. I, I had become an incredible justifier. I had because I had no comprehension of what it looked like to be justified. Now, I, I don't know if any of you guys can relate to this. Um, I used to think that my story didn't have a whole lot of merit um, because it wasn't this, this like drastic, I was a drug dealer and came out of this kind of stuff. We've heard some of these other stories from, from Tony and Walt and others. That, that they've got these incredible testimonies. But what I've come to realize is that there are a lot more people like me who are trying to earn their way, who are trying to be good enough, who are trying to behave their way in order to be able to be in God's good graces when it doesn't work like that. You see, my faith was more about what, what I was doing or not doing rather than what Jesus had done. And it, it wasn't until I was directed to a pas- passage in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter two, actually, that the, the word of God spoken through Paul, who, who, who was received these words through the spirit, that I started to, to gain a glimpse of grace for the very first time. And there is power in the word of God. And those words, they still remain so true to me, so important to me. It says, for, the, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, not of your own works, lest anyone should boast. In other words, God moved first. God offered this sin exchange. He he offered this perfection swap. He offered this to me and it's already been done, not by anything that I will or have done, but only because of what Christ has already done. And it's because of that that now I've come to understand and I resonate with the words that Paul also wrote to the Galatians in chapter two when he says this, so we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ, not by the works of the law because the works of the law, no one will be justified. No one's gonna be justified by the works of the law. And then he says this, and I love this, this is one of my life verses. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. And I myself no longer live, but Christ lives in me. My condition has now changed. I have gone from being guilty to being innocent. And the life that I now live in the body, I live in the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And I do not set aside the grace of God for if righteousness could be gained through the law, then Christ died for nothing. Guys, I've come to understand, and I hope that you can understand, you can grasp this with me today, that it's not by my own works, it's not by your own works. It is not based on the progress that I'm making at becoming a better person. It is not a process of who I am becoming, but it it is a declaration of who I am. You see, this is the difference between justification and sanctification. These are big spiritual words that we oftentimes don't really understand, but I'm going to break it down real simple for you today. Justification happens in an instance. It is the determination in a court of law. Because of the cross, we are declared innocent. You see, God sees us through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's just if I'd never sinned in the first place. It's just if I'd been righteous all along. It's just if I'd been made to be in the presence of God. That's what justification is. Sanctification is the process in this life to catch up to what Jesus has already declared us to be. Less of self and more of Jesus. It's working out those internal things and and holding on to this identity that God has given us as, as being innocent in the first place because of what Christ has done. Now, all of this is, this is really good. It's, it's theological, it's doctrinal, it helps us to understand and grasp the gospel. But it's more than that because, because we have to ask our, ourselves this question, what does it look like to live justified if this really is our reality? If we have gone from being guilty to being justified and therefore declared innocent, 
then what does that mean for you and me? And I'm not gonna belabor this a whole lot, but just uh, three things I think that it really, like we need to put into play if this is our reality. The first thing is this, if I have been justified, then I have no more need of defense. I have no more need of excuses. I have no more need of feeling guilty for the things that I've done, that I've done in the past. Because in God's eyes, because of the cross, it's just if I've never done those wrong things because the price has already been paid and the perfection has already been transferred. So why live in the past? Why give defense? Why give excuses? Which leads me to the next thing, which is that we have no need to hide from the ugly. We have no need to hide our ugly. Yes, I've done what I have done, but I am no longer the man that I used to be. Romans chapter four, verse five says it this way. Man, this is just, this is powerful and you need to hear this today. However, to the one who does not work, but instead trust God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. You see, the cross is not for those that are already righteous. It's not for those that have worked themselves up the scale of morality. The cross is for the ungodly, the wicked, the evil, in order to make them righteous. That's the only way that we can get there, guys. And that's what Paul is saying. And we need to understand that. Therefore, there's no use in hiding the ugly and there's no sense in being ashamed of what we have done in the past or even the sins that still entangle us today because it's through those things that God actually receives glory by demonstrating his grace in our life. You see, I, I'm not proud of the bad things that I do or the things that I've done, but I also have no need to hide them either because God's grace has covered them. That's how somebody lives if they're justified. Man, I'm still learning that. I, I, wish, I wish that that was a full reality for me, but there's still some times that I wanna hide. There's still some times that, that I don't wanna confess, that I don't wanna share. It's because I get caught back in this, this guilty mentality of this other way of, of looking at myself and this other identity. And I think that that's the third thing that we need to hold on to. If we are living like we're justified, then we need to live in our true identity, in our true reality. And here it is, I, I, no longer am I a bad person trying to do good things. I am a person that is justified, living my life as though I am innocent. Why not live? Why not live in that reality? Because I, I think that oftentimes, you know, we, we get into this place and none of us are, are perfect in and of ourselves. We're gonna to continue to sin. I've been a pastor for many years. I've been a follower of Jesus for more than that. And I still sin almost every day. But I think when God looks at us, I don't think that he looks at me and says, man, what, what a thief, what a liar, what a pervert. <laughs> I think he, he looks at us and he says, why is my son, why is my son taking what's not his? I've declared him a giver like me. I think he, he looks at us and he says, why is my daughter speaking falsely of somebody else, saying things that are slanderous? She is a truth teller like me. Why are my children settling for less than what they deserve, what I've designed them for, what I've created them for? They are heirs to the throne. I have declared them innocent. So why are they living like they're still guilty? See, we often aspire to how we see ourselves. So when we start seeing ourselves as guilty apart from the cross, but innocent because of the cross, then we start to live our lives as if we were innocent. Doing what is right because that is what God has declared us to be. Guys, this is a game changer. When we start to think of ourselves, not just as forgiven, but also as declared innocent, we start living up to that identity we have the ability to do so. Guys, apart from Christ, I was guilty. But because of the, the cross, I now declared innocent. Jesus has justified me. And he wants to justify you. And I don't know where you stand with him right now. I don't know what you've done in the past. I don't know what you're currently involved in doing. But wouldn't you like to have a clean slate? Wouldn't you like to be declared innocent? Wouldn't you like to not have these things following you around, these demons in the closet, these things that you have not shared with anybody because you're scared of what they might think of you? They're scared of what God might do to you? God has already done the work. He's already made it available for you. 
He's just waiting for you to show up and to plead Jesus. So, don't know where you're at today, but today would be a great day to step on the bridge to claim the justification that Jesus has made available to you. If that's you today, man, I'd love for you to identify yourself. Email me, talk to us, text us, find us somehow. Let us know that you made this decision and let us help you walk this life of justification that Jesus has laid out for you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the day. and Thank you for these opportunities that you give us to be able to better understand your good news. Lord, I, I pray that this, this sense of justification would, would sit deeply inside of each and every one of us, that you continue to help us understand it and grasp it to its fullest so that we can just root out all of the things in our life that are, that are evil and are bad and, are, and, and cause us to be guilty, and we can hold on to the things that you have declared, declared us and claimed us to be. And Lord, in doing so, Others would look at us and not, not see our righteousness, but Father, see the grace that covers us and, and desire to be like that. And we can point them to your son who can do the same thing through them. Lord, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Don't forget, we're a people following Jesus to those not yet.